Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. The human experience is making a new post every sometimes with my guest, Tim Urban. Tim, it's a pleasure. Welcome to HXB. Thank you for having me. Tim, I, uh, I find your, your writing incredible, man. I, I relate with it so much from your procrastination post to the Elon Musk series. Seems like you've written about everything that there is to write about. It seems like everything that you're writing about goes viral. I mean, what's, what's the secret? Well, I, I think, um, it's once you have a decent sized audience, um, that is aware of what you're doing and is into it, then, then I think, um, it's, uh, it's, it's about kind of delighting that audience and, and you, you can, you know, you, you, what you do can spread throughout that audience each time you do it. And so that's going to seem um, like a very successful post um, each time because the audience is of a certain size. But I would still say, actually, um, most things don't really go viral uh, in the traditional sense. Um, uh, you know, viral to me is when it's all over the place and it's reaching all kinds of people who have never heard of, of what you're doing. Um, and, um, and that's not really uh, what I'm aiming to do anymore. At the beginning, I definitely was because I was trying to get attention for the new thing we were doing and trying to pick topics uh, that, would, that would really uh, make a splash kind of in that way. Yeah. Well, let's, well, let's back up a little bit. I mean, uh, wait, but why is this sort of um, content? I mean, what do you, what do you call it now? Is it a blog still? Y yeah, I, I call it a blog. Uh, it's a terrible word. Um, it is. I call myself a blogger, which is a terrible word. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, I'm writing long form articles, um, on my own, site. So uh, whatever that is in the world, um, I, I, I guess that's, um, that's, that's a blog. But it's almost like you have this magical decoder ring where, you know, you, you punch in these numbers and you click viral and it just, it, it explodes. So where did, you know, where did you start? Where were the humble beginnings that, you know, no one ever hears about? Yeah, well, I, so um, from, from, I think about 2005 to 2011, um, I had another blog that was much more of a kind of a norm, you know, traditional blog. The articles were much shorter. They weren't illustrated and they were kind of sometimes about my day or about things that annoyed me. Um, and that I did that for six years and I wrote 300 blog posts and there's almost no chance you've ever heard of it because uh, it, it, nothing ever went viral on that. Um, it was, uh, it was read by a, a you know, small group of people that really liked it, and I, we had fun, and I really liked writing it. Um, but um, but that, so that, that's, that's where I you know, learned how to write blog posts and kind of found my voice and learned about the relationship with readers and my own process for kind of um, coming up with ideas and writing, you know, getting in the habit of writing things down when I would have an observation during the day. Um, and so I, I kind of learned all the, the important kind of skills then for writing a blog. And then, um, a couple of years after I, I stopped writing that, um, I decided with, uh, Andrew, my business partner, uh, cause we have this other business that we were running together, um, to, to, to try to start kind of, to try to do the blog thing again, but to really like do it right, you know, take everything I learned and, um, and try to uh, try to kind of go at it um, in a in a really serious way. Uh, you know, we we saw all kinds of content um, all over the Facebook news feed and and things like that on Twitter and just just articles that were okay that you know were were, were usually very short, uh, you know, big headlines, lists, um, stock photos, and sometimes you know they'd make you laugh. Sometimes they'd be great, 
Um, but, you know, very often they'd be okay. And, um, and once in a while there'd be something really good. And you'd see it on your newsfeed or somewhere else like four times or five times. And then someone would email it to you. And then, and then it would appear in one of those uh, newsletters, you know, and, and, and you kind of, we kind of thought about it and said, you know, when, when something, when someone really puts everything they have into an article and it's like this really great thing, uh, it seems to make the rounds. And so even though there's kind of an ocean of content, um, you know, out there uh, that we're kind of inside of, it, the, there's not an ocean of really good content. And so that was kind of the, the hypothesis. And so started Wait But Why in 2013. Um, so it's been three years. Yeah, it's been about three years. Let's explore the the process. I mean, you you mentioned that. Let's let's explore the process for you. Um, I mean, how does how does that begin? I mean, you you take notes during the day about what you kind of what annoys you. You said. Well, so in the in the old blog, uh, I was doing things. You know, nineteen things I don't understand, and twenty five things that annoy me. And it's actually annoying because this was this is one of the things that annoy me now. Uh, one of the things that annoys me is that I was doing these lists, like, you know, number of things that something, uh, you know, 15 things that something. That was a format that I, I, was, I thought was all, you know, clever and fresh, and I really liked it, and it was fun to write in that format, and people liked to read it. This was 2005, 2006, 2007. Um, and in the time since then, it has become the most overdone, overused um, format that now when someone sees an article that, you know, something things that something, uh, I think everyone just kind of thinks this is going to be cheap, and low quality, and someone is, you know, just trying to get clicks. And it's actually a shame because, uh, because those, um, those were really fun articles to write. Now I feel like it, 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 it's, you know, you don't get the benefit of the doubt with them anymore, but that's an aside. Um, so back then it was just, yeah, I mean, I would think of something, I would look at the dishwasher and think, what the hell goes on in there? <laughs> how, 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 how possibly does everything in there get clean? Like what, what is happening in there? And, and I would, and, and the detergent, I put in this little thing, and close it. <laughs> how does it go from this little thing into all the water and not get used up right away? I mean, I was just very confusing. So that would be an example. I would have that thought. I would just write it down. And then when it was, and then I would time to do a blog post and I would go kind of say, okay, well, there's, but there's, there's a, the list of things that I don't understand has now grown again since the last time I, I, I emptied it out for a blog post. It's now up to, you know, 19. I always had 19 things I don't understand. So I would take them and I would write a new post and then I'd start every time I didn't understand something, I would, I would put it in that list until it hit 19 again. And then I would write a new one. So that was my process with the old blog. Um, and, um, with, now with wait, but why, you know, the, the topics are much broader. And so now it's, it's still, st I still will put stuff like that. I will, I'll just, if I have an observation, I think, I bet you other people think this too. I bet no one else knows how to, what the dishwasher ha uh, how it works, but, um, but no one talks about it. I'll just write it down. But also I'll write down, I keep hearing about Bitcoin and I have no idea how that works. Or I'll think, wow, there's so many people in unhappy marriages. What the hell's going on there? So I'll go write it down. Um, and uh, and you just get, if you just get in that habit, uh, you end up with this incredibly long list uh, of, of thoughts and ideas and observations and insights. And sometimes this is a great conversation you have at lunch with someone. And, and no, it's just one of these really, just really interesting conversations. And, you, and I will finish that and I'll think, oh, wow, there's so many interesting things that came up just now and I'll just write them down. And, um, and that becomes your topic list or that becomes kind of your, 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 uh, your source material to then build upon. I mean, I, I really want to break this down. I want to I wanna demystify it, kind of de deconstruct this process. What is the first thing that you do in the morning when you wake up? So I've actually gotten better. I used to just take my laptop right onto the bed and start like doing stuff, emails, which is a terrible thing to do. Uh, it would then be two or three hours later and I would still be doing that, hating myself. So I've, I've gotten better um, about not, not even have the laptop in the bedroom anymore ever. So now I, I, I'm much more in control. I get up and I will turn on, well, it depends. If I'm, if I'm in a, um, if, if I'm trying to, if, there's certain days when I'm, in the process of brainstorming or outlining a post. And if that's the case, then the morning is precious 
brain time because your brain is in a very specific, very important uh, state to like the first 20 minutes, 30 minutes when you wake up. Um, it's this raw state. And, and you know, I, I, actually, I actually intentionally try to think about the topic and the brainstorm and the puzzle I'm trying to put together the night before, like right before I go to bed. And, you know, that kind of, I think, you know, that you, same way you, you start, you know, if you're, if you're playing a game incessantly late at night and then you'll dream about it, it's that kind of thing. Or you're, 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 you know, thinking about one kind of one person a lot, you'll dream about them. So, because your brain takes whatever, it takes a signal from your consciousness about what should we be trying to figure out in our sleep? Okay, got it. And then it works on that while you sleep. So I'll think about whatever the post is I'm trying to do and kind of signal to my brain, this is what we're, you need to work on tonight. And then um, when I wake up in the morning, if, 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 that's why it's so bad to pick the laptop up because it just shatters. It's just you just you waste the, the insights that are, that are right there waiting for you yeah. and you just distract yourself with other things. So I just I just try to get up and get in the shower and just start thinking. And it's, it's usually amazing um, how many new thoughts come in the same way if you, if you want to memorize something. You know, you do it right before you go to bed and then in the morning when you wake up, uh, it, it's solidified. So, so that, that's in those days. But most days I'm not in that zone. I'm either just, you know, writing a post or I'm, uh, you know, in between posts or whatever. And in those days I'll turn on an audio book um, or a podcast that I'm, you know, into. And I'll just turn it on my speaker and just kind of carry the speaker around with me as I do stuff, which will be showering and um, – uh, I, I'm not great about breakfast, but I'll try to like have something so that it's not. Do you I'm usually head. take any days off? Uh, I have a, I have a schedule now, which I'm trying to stick on because I used to take no days off and, and I was just always kind of in some state of either procrastinating from working or working. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, and I, I decided that I needed to kind of force myself to take time off, even on those weeks when I felt like I have not been productive enough, mm -hmm. which is, the, you know, that's when you'll just get into the trap of you'll just never take a day off. because you. Uh, so I now say Saturdays is a day off and I'll intentionally schedule, you know, uh, a hangout with a friend at 2.30, which is like the, the worst thing I could do if I wanted to be productive that day. Because when I wake up, that's looming ahead, so I'll never get anything done before that. And then by the time I'm back, it's like 6.30 and now... So I'll do those things in, on purpose to just say, wake up Saturday, no, you know, w w nothing productive needs to happen today, um, and what do I want to do? So I'll do that, and then I, I also try, um, not often, uh, often not successfully, but I try to just at 9 p.m. just stop working, and and you know, then I can start looking forward to, it, uh, you know. Uh, Actually, I'm going to, oh, at 9 p.m., I can, I can do this at 9. Oh, I'll do this tonight instead of thinking, oh, at some point I need to do this. I'm like, oh, I can even do it tonight. Uh, and I know this sounds crazy to, <laughs> to because it's just like 9 is not a very early time. You're not supposed to be working that late. But um, for me, it's, it's I will just continue all the way until I go to sleep. And it's not because I'm such a workaholic. It's much more because um, if I know I have all that time, I just won't be productive till pretty late in the day. I'll just... Uh, I'll just dick around basically and, uh, you know, on and off until five or six. And then I'll say, God, I can't believe I haven't done anything today. And then I'll just work till two in the morning. And I think, um, I, I, I've been working on kind of setting aside these no work blocks, which I think forces me to treat the work time more seriously. Yeah. I've been, I've been doing the same thing minus the dicking around. I've, I've been really just, I'm, I'm a workaholic. I mean, I, I just, pour myself into whatever I'm doing. So for you, I mean, is there something that you feel determines that you've had a successful writing day? It's, it's so black and white for me, which is a, something, again, I really don't want to be the case because it's not a very healthy way to be. But for me, it's it's often that I, uh, I feel I'm like really unhappy with my work day and that I just I, I got a little stuff done only, and the stuff I got done was not the important stuff. It was that urgent stuff that doesn't actually, that's not what matters. And, uh, or I, I'm, I'm in one of those zones where I, I'm, I'm in a really good zone, and I'll like get 14 hours of, you know, of, of uh, blog post, you know, work done. And then, and then I'm happy about that, but then my, the rest, you know, I've, I've all these texts built up in my phone, people being like, 
you know, I'm just being non-responsive. And I'm, and I'm, so it's, it's really like, you know, uh, the, the answer is somewhere in between there. And so a truly successful day for me, um, which I wish happened more, is, you know, I, 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 I would get up and I would, you know, around 10 a.m. I finished all the morning stuff and I sit down and I do emails and meetings and other things like that until about one. I try to schedule things in that window 10 to one. And then at one o'clock, I shut all that stuff down and I dive into creating whatever I'm working on creating at that time, a blog post or maybe a video um, uh, whatever it is. And I work on that until about nine. And then I stop feeling great about the day because I just got a ton of stuff done and I'm caught up with my other stuff from the morning. And now I can enjoy some time off. And then because of that, because then I give myself the three or four hours of leisure time, I feel fine going to bed at 12 or one, which for me is early because uh, if I don't do that, what happens is I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, not let myself do anything leisurely until, you know, it's like 12 or one time to go to bed. And then it's like some part of me is like some part of my brain, the leisure part is like, no, we're getting our time. We're not doing nothing. I'm going to now go see what the sports scores are the day. And then I'm going to read this article. And before you know it, it's 245. And now I've like kind of destroyed my next day. It's something that I find pretty remarkable about your writing, which, which I really enjoy is that you have this sort of it's almost this sort of sardonic, sinfully mocking, st- almost dark style. I mean, is that me? Am I projecting? Do you do you feel that way? Or it's, it's humorful. You have this sense of humor that that relates through your posts. But I mean, do you do you feel like you're mocking things in a way? Well, I, I think um, there's a lot of there's a lot of things in life. Um, in the world to ma- that, that, that kind of just are begging to be made fun of. And there's kind of a lot of things about humans, and I'm the, the specimen number one for myself, <laughs> that are to be made fun of. So I'm usually writing from a place of um, I've been dealing with my own like human flaws all week. So I'm already in kind of that mood. And then I'm also, whatever I'm writing about, either I've been reading a bunch of experts or watching interviews, or I've been just brainstorming why people are doing a certain thing. And there's so much ridiculousness in all of that, usually, um, that, that I, I do get into, I can, I can get into a, a tone where I'm, um, where I am, I, I just want to point that out, either because it's funny to point it out or because um, I, I want people to be thinking about it more. But, um, but I think there's also, um, I, I think kind of beneath that, kind of like that, that's within like a well of kind of excited optimism as well, um, because I'm also kind of like really, like really, I'm, I really like life and I really like people, even like people I don't like. Like I, I like the concept of people and I like the concept <laughs> of humanity and, I, and I'm excited about the future. And so, um, so I, I, I think there's, um, yeah, I, 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 hope, I hope that it's not like, you know, cynical. I, I, I like it being kind of mocking without being uh, really negative and cynical. Um, because that's not really who I am. So I hope that, you know, I wanted to reflect that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've got a few more questions on your writing style and then I promise we'll move on. I, I don't, I, I doubt this is fun for you, but I feel like people might want to know, you know, kind of what, what drives you and how, how you've, you know, sort of developed this, this style that reaches, reaches so many people when you are creating uh, a post, is there a process in which you sort of visualize where the post is going organically piece by piece or how much how much of the story arc have you kind of dis- decided on already before you begin writing um yeah so for me v- basically all of it uh, that's a really important thing for me because i need to um when I start writing the first word, I need to kind of be ahead of the reader. I need to be in control. I need to kind of know the plan. And I'm, I want to be, I want to be in the mode where I feel like I'm this, this storyteller talking to people who don't know the story yet. And, um, and it's, it would be a terrible feeling for me to start a story with a bunch of people and, uh, and not, and just be making it up as I go. I just would be much worse um, I would be much worse at telling the story. I wouldn't have the confidence of a storyteller who knows where he's going. I wouldn't be able to foreshadow. I wouldn't mm. be able to to kind of to set the mood in the way I want and bring the mood to where I want and all of those things. And so for me, if I wrote, if I, you know, some people I think 
thrive in a very different way. They just start writing and things happen and then they go revise later. I hate that because if I just start writing, I don't know where I'm going. By the time I figure out where I'm going, now I have to go back and fix the tone and everything because it's just not what I mm, wanted it to be. Yeah. Um, so for me, I would say more than 50%, sometimes like even more than like 70% of the total time between when I say, okay, uh, here's the topic of the next post, let me get started, to when I'm published to post. Um, more than half of that time happens before I write the first word because uh, there's always a big, you know, sometimes it's just a post, like you said, about you know, procrastination. No, that kind of po- those kind of posts are uh, how to pick a life partner. Those posts are just mostly me thinking about what I think about stuff and, and thinking about what I've observed in other people and what I've gone through myself. So I, I have a lot of brainstorming time and a lot of thinking time, or sometimes it's a post about something in tech or science or something like that history, in which case I'm going to be just doing a ton of reading and research and interview watching. Um, But either way, that process is the beginning where I'm just gathering information and just kind of putting it in a pile in a, in a document, just gathering, gathering, gathering uh, without any discernment yet for what, uh, what what should or should not make the post or what the actual structure is. And then I go through the, the next process, the next stage, stage two kind of, which to me is the hardest part, the least fun part, and the part where I definitely am tempted to procrastinate away from it the most, which is I'm currently, as we speak, by the way, in a full uh, procrastination zone from one of those, from that, from the second stage. I've done the fun part. I have all the ideas. I'm excited about the post. And now I have to do the actual kind of homework, which is taking that pile, deciding what the post actually is, what's going to get what's going to make it into the post, what I'm going to leave for some other post sometime, what the structure is of the post, which can be a hundred different structures. It's not like an obvious structure. If you look at a bunch of my posts or, or any bloggers, um, or, you know, there, there's often, you'll see my posts have um, many different structures. And so you have to kind of decide that. And it's torture because I, if I decide on one, I think, well, this other one, you know, I, I don't like it. It's not quite, you know, there could, what if there's something more creative, a more creative structure, and then... And then, you know, actually figuring out the, the outline, the arc, you know, you know, what, is, is, is it two, three main parts or is it a list of 10 things or is it one big story? And am I telling this like I'm inventing a character and telling it through them as like a fiction is like a seems like a fiction story or am I me? Am I am I just being me, the author? Uh, the, 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 am I just being myself and talking to the readers like earnestly, you know, and so you have to kind of make all those decisions because if I don't make the decisions, like that, then they um they often just get made kind of by accident. And I don't think that ends up as good as good a post. So that that that's that's what takes up you know a ton of the time. That's remarkable. I I love that. Um, I mean, is there when you look at other blog other blog writers, blog posters? I, I mean, are there certain weaknesses that you see that that other people are kind of making mistakes that you see that you notice? Well. It's hard. I mean, I'm still still trying to figure out kind of how to do my own thing uh, enough that I'm I don't think I'm quite ready to kind of critique others that much. But one, but a couple of things I will say that I just notice uh, both in my my old blog writing and some blogs I see today is um, I, I think people are sometimes um, they 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 you know they they have their journalist voice on you know or something like that. Um, they they have um, a certain tone on that's not really human. It's journalist E and that I just feel like we're not in that, that era anymore. Like, I, I don't think that if you look at what's really popping online now, it's, it's often like a person being a person um, uh, in, in writing versus, you know, someone, you know, the, the, okay. The ultimate example is like, you know, uh, 20 years ago, like a front page New York times article. That's not a human at all. That is a very specific, voice, which is, it is, you know, super formal and it's, you're not, you're not supposed to see any semblance of personality. You're not supposed to see, no, you're not supposed to know anything about the, whoever the human writing it is. They, they, they are completely hidden. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then you go to something like today, something like my blog or many others. Uh, I think of, you know, James Clear. I think of Mark Manson. I think of Ali Brosh and hyperbole and a half. I think, of, you know, these people, they are in a hundred percent of a human. Um, it's, it's it went from 0% to 100%. Now, not everyone. Some people want to have a certain kind of voice that's not necessarily them, and that's art, and that's fine. 
but I think a lot of people are trying to go for, you know, connecting with an audience, building a following, and they try to, and, and, and they, they, they're, they, I think they need to do a better job uh, often of just getting to that, you know, 90 or 100% human level uh, and getting farther and farther because people are scared because they think, you know, I'm a writer. I, I, I have to be, um, people will think I'm a better writer if I act like a, a writer. It's like, no, act like yourself. Um, you can still have a, uh, a writing style that's not exactly how you speak, but I just think that that to me is something I think, you know, modern day writers should be thinking. Where do you see your readers kind of going? I mean, is there any specific topic or genre that you see your readers going to? Or it, like, are they magnetized by your relationship posts or? Well, what I would say is, um, you know, because I've written about a bunch of different things, I would say there's, there's, uh, there, there are some readers who are just really similar to me, in which case they might like a lot of the different things I've write, written about because the things I've chosen to write about are things that I, as a just person, happen to find interesting and you know fun enough to dive into for a couple of weeks. And some people are really similar to me. And if I'm writing about artificial intelligence, they're like, oh, that's, that's, I love that topic. That's so interesting. And then if I'm writing about relationships, they're like, oh, that's kind of how I think about relationships, you know. And so th those people, are, of course, are, those are right down the middle, way but why readers, those are going to be um, the the people who like it the most. But then there's some people who they really like posts like artificial intelligence, and they like posts about uh, um, other technology and Tesla, and and they want to hear about the Fermi paradox, and they're kind of these heady, kind of sciency tech techy type things. And those people. Um, they, I, I, you know, they, they all, you know, if I get an email from one of them, they all, I can tell, you know, it's not, it's not surprising when they say, oh, my favorite posts are this, this, and this. I'm saying, you're right, because you're, you like that kind of post. And if I write about relationships, they might read it, but they might think, oh, well, I, I, I thought this was like an awesome tech blog. What, what are you doing? And then other people who got, you know, who, who first found the blog because of procrastination or because I talked about why you shouldn't care what other people think of you or, um, you know, why people act a certain way on Facebook. It's kind of human psychology kind of. Uh, poking fun at life, but also analyzing, um, you know, how we can be better people somehow. Right. Uh, those people, I think, um, again, some of them also happen to really or be into the, the to the tech topics. But then I think some of those people are kind of like, you know, they 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 are sad when it's when it's a post that's not about, um, you know, about something with with humanity. So I think um, I, I think it just depends. I think uh, because when you're gonna when you're writing a very broad blog, you have the advantage of you're going to attract, you know, there's going to be some posts on Wait But Why for, for a huge group of people. You know, what, there's going to be a huge group of people where at least one post appeals to them. Well, if I were just writing about sports, you know, now, now that, you know, now there's fewer people uh, that can find something on the site they like. So, but that's the advantage. The disadvantage is, you know, if I were just writing about sports, there's the people who like the site, they like everything on the site because this is their thing. And, and the disadvantage for me is that, you know, there's, I, no matter what I write, there's some way but why readers who are disappointed that that's the topic because that's not what they're interested in. So, you know, I don't know. I just think it's, um, it's, it's a trade-off. But you've built this massive following. I mean, it's huge. Within, within three years, you've built, I mean, it's, it's a business. I mean, you've, you've created a business out of this blogging idea and, and people, love it i mean it i mean you guys are getting what like at least a million reader readers a month right yeah and i mean so that must put a lot of pressure on you as well right oh, oh yeah i mean it's it's um uh it's it's really mind-blowing if i think too hard about like what the number like the actual how many people that actually is because um that's just not like humans are not programmed to uh, like uh, to absorb that kind of information um, and to, you know, to not freak out. So if I think too hard about it, yeah, then I become overcome with pressure uh, and perfectionism where I'm like, you know, that can't, I can't put anything, you know, I even just, you know, I'll send, you know, every post comes along with an email because I'll every, you know, I don't use the email list very much other than to send out new posts. But when I do, I'll often put a little note at the top, just a little friendly note saying something that we're working on or a new thing that, uh, that I want to point them to or just to kind of update people on what the plan is for the next month, whatever it is. And so I, I, I usually just write that, read it over once and send it. I don't even think about it, like as if I were sending an email to a friend. And then so once in a while, like I'll, I'll, I'll 
I'll, it'll hit me as I'm doing it how many people are going to I'm sending that <laughs> note to and then I become paralyzed and I can't do it I, I just can't it's just I, I'll read it 10 times I get incredibly self-conscious I doubt everything so that's a, it's not a good creative place to be in if you think too hard so I actually and but the truth is you end up your your brain kind of you know is happily not conscious of the truth with with, with the readership and I think for me it, it feels very similar you know it's different but it doesn't feel that different having um, the million people or so visiting a month now versus having a thousand people visiting my old blog. It just, you, you, I don't know, my brain kind of adjusts in the same way. And even though I know it's a very different situation, it kind of feels the same. Like I was very gratified when I wrote something I thought was good on the old thing. And I, and I, and I feel similarly now. Um, and do you feel like, do you feel like you're adjusting your writing style because of how large your user base is now? Well, so that, yeah, so that's, that's interesting because it, there are some ways this is, I, I definitely, it definitely affects me in some ways it's good. One way is that I know that if I write anything about you know, science, tech, history, uh, politics, anything, and there's something about it that's not correct or that's like only talking about one side, there's going to be 15 absolute experts in that thing in the comment section saying how wrong I am, which makes me lose credibility to everybody because all the people who didn't realize that when they read it, because they're not experts, then they read those experts saying that and they think, oh, I can't trust this guy. This writer exactly, is yeah. So I, now I'm like, and, and, and likewise, if I ever even accidentally, like one eighth plagiarize something by just kind of doing a diagram in the similar way to someone else, the way someone else did, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna people are gonna absolutely call me out on that publicly in front of everyone. So it keeps me, it, I have to be, I have to have a lot of, um, uh, has to be uh, a high standard for my, for, 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 for accuracy and for originality. Um, and th that's a good thing. That keeps me like, you know, just tip top shape as a writer in that regard. I can't get lazy. I can't get sneaky. I can't get, you know, whatever. Um, on the, the, the time when it can be negative is um, if, you know, I, I, I'm someone who I think a lot of writers, I think a lot of creative people are sense like somewhat sensitive and they want to be liked. <laughs> they like to be liked. Like, um, you know, people talk about Obama like that. Like that's one of his, his problems as a president is he, he doesn't like to not be liked. And I think there's a lot of people who have that quality and it can, and it can be problematic, um, in certain circumstances. So I think for me, like just knowing, um, that a lot of the people who do read the blog like it and like me, it's like, I don't, it's like I, I then you can quickly stop, take that side of you that's like edgier, that can be kind of a dick, that can kind of, um, kind of, uh, just make fun of a certain kind of person in a pretty kind of harsh, but funny way. Uh, you can, you can quickly kind of put that part of you away and say, no, 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 no. Sorry. Yeah, this is just, you know, I just, I can't, you can't, I can't say that about, and I don't, <laughs> and I don't think that's good. That's, that's not, you know, my, cause, cause, cause then what happens is your taste starts to be disappointed by like what you're putting out. Like you're like my taste might think, Oh, that's so funny when someone else, when some other writer writes something, but then I find myself, you know, whenever I had that thought, I'd be like, Oh, I don't know. And it's like, no, I mean, if, if you got to still stick with your taste, even if some people are going to hate it. And especially some of the people who already really like you, who, the, you know, I always, I have such an affection and fondness for anyone who likes the blog. And I just don't want to like, hurt anyone's feelings who really likes what I'm doing, but you can't let that affect your tone and your, and make you worse. So I think that that's something, you know, that's, that can be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. I understand completely. You know, there's, I'm a huge stand up comedy nerd. I, I like to study stuff and, and, uh, there's, there's this sort of saying it, it they call it the forever box. And, Inside the forever box, you can say anything, literally anything that you want, and people just love, will love it. Like, you get into this rapport with your audience, and they just love what you're saying and doing. So they, they laugh automatically. Elon Musk, it, this, is, it, this is such a huge thing, just because, I mean, if I feel like when Elon, Elon Musk enters a room, like harps play angels sing and like there's this there's there is something happening with elon musk that you know should be noted 
and he he invited you to interview him and and write a series on him. How how did that work out? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was um that was like the coolest, definitely the coolest thing that's happened in my life in my life so far. Um, he so yeah, I mean, I think he's a pretty amazing person, and the more I've learned about um him, I've learned a ton about him and what he's done and his his life uh, in the last year. And I've been more impressed. So I feel like, you know, it made me realize that, you know, you assume someone who gets talked about so much and praised so much is probably overrated a little bit. And actually, I kind of think he's, I kind of think he's underrated. I don't think people quite get yet, you know, how incredible what he's doing is. Um, and so, um, so, you know, I was a, I was already, you know, a pretty big fan. And um, yeah, he's, he kind of started, in, I don't know, it was like 2015, like early 2015, he started tweeting uh, tweeting out wait, but why posts like he did it three different times hmm. and uh, and you know each time was just completely like a mind blowing day of my life and you know and it started to hit me I was like okay this dude's aware of the blog like officially like he's just a, and so um, so that that was awesome and then and then and then his uh, his um, assistant you know reached out and you know and actually you know said he would like to get on the phone one day and just talk about uh, maybe some doing some writing about his industries and if that's something you might be interested in. And they were very polite uh, as if they were kind of like intruding on my time, which is hilarious. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so that happened and I, I, I suddenly I'm on the phone with him and um, <laughs> <laughs> really not, you know, not, not, not what I saw coming in real life, but <laughs> and, and, and it wasn't much of a plan other than kind of, I think he thought that, um, you know, my very long form, very uh, thorough um, style was, was very, uh, was, was, was a good match for his industries. And, I, and I, I think that's probably correct because what he's doing with Tesla, what he's doing with SpaceX, um, those things are so complex. There's so much background you need to know to understand why those things matter so much and why we should be as the public should be in in great support of both of those missions uh you really need to educate people on those things for them to understand and i know that because i didn't quite get it when i first started this whole thing and then i started reading and said oh oh man like this stuff is um you know yeah this this is really really important for so many reasons that people don't get so I think that was the idea. He said, you know, th this guy will, will write a, you know, really thorough posts on this. And that's what we need because I don't have time for a three hour interview, uh, which is what, you know, he would need in order to, um, to explain everything. He, his interviews are these little sound bites in 20 minutes and they ask the same surface questions and, um, people ask him about, you know, PayPal and there's just no, no one, no one really, uh, gives you know he doesn't have the chance and and his companies don't really have a mechanism to to educate so I think that was the the reason behind it and then yeah and then I spent six months writing you know four posts that would that would be like a together a pretty long book yeah that's amazing it, I mean it it really does show I mean you were invited to a TED talk I mean it it really does show the success of wait but why just because of all of these things I mean it seems like you guys have captured lightning in a bottle here. Yeah, well, I, I always have the feeling uh, like it's it's um, it, it could it could go away. Uh, and this is not like you know it's it's not like we have these um, you know customers with accounts and we have like you know contracts with with things like you know business when you feel like okay we've like built something that's solid like you know blog you can be popular and then they can go away. So it's really it's true. It's, very a lot of a lot of um, gratitude every day that this is because again I spent six years as a blogger without this happening so I'm really grateful when it is happening and just you know trying to enjoy it while it lasts and hope that it's hope that it sticks and that I can keep putting things out that uh, that kind of warrant this kind of uh, readership. That's good, man. I, I really really uh, respect the the gratitude part. I, I think that's a, that's a that's a huge deal. So Tim, let's let's get back into your process a little bit. I mean. When you feel stuck within an idea, is there any certain thing that you go to where you feel like it invigorates you or gives you creativity? I mean, sometimes I, I will literally just have to like reset. If I'm just in the bad zone, I'll 
I'll go for a walk, I'll take a shower, I'll go to sleep, I'll change rooms. Um, but uh, honestly, it's mostly when I'm stuck, it's because I'm avoiding, you know, it's like I'll, I'll, I'll be working and I'll kind of hit a bump. Uh, something that I'm like, oh, wait, that's a problem. That's not going to, that, that won't reconcile with the other plan I have here. We ha something has to change. Shit. And then, um, and then what I do is then I will start doing something else because that's pretty hard, what I just described. And actually, I don't want to deal with that right at this exact moment. So I'm going to deal with something else. And what happens is the bump grows. Even though the bump hasn't changed in size, in my head, the bump becomes a little bit of a hill. <laughs> and then it becomes a mountain. And then it becomes Mount Everest as days, as you know, suddenly one, two, three, four days have passed. And I, have, I just got away from my process for four days because of a bump that I could have gotten over in 10 minutes if I had just spent like 10 focused minutes working on it. So often when I'm having a problem, it's because I'm just avoiding. And, if, and the thing that solves it is when I just confront, the, confront Mount Everest, work on it for a second, realize it's just, remember that it's just a bump, fix the bump, and then I get all excited and then I keep going. But again, that, that process, that, that between when I leave the bump to when I get back, that can take a, that can really eat up a bunch of days when I'm doing all of this important, uh, not important, but urgent stuff. Um, you know, emails and, uh, you know, meetings and other things that I, that are just not the real thing I'm trying to do. So um, to me, it's often, <laughs> the solution is just close down everything else on my computer and just sit there and look at it and think, and get back into it. And sometimes 10 minutes later, I'm rolling again. That's so, so interesting to the whole creative process and, and really, you know, immersing yourself, putting yourself completely into, you know, writing and, and doing it full time, the way that you're doing it. Um, you know, is, is there, is there a, a post of yours on the site that is kind of a favorite? I mean, my personal favorite, type posts are just the type of posts that I would like to read the most and that are just, uh, it, I would say it's the, for me, ironically, it's some of the posts that have no writing at all. It's just like, um, <laughs> I did a post called putting time in perspective. I'm looking which, at that one right now. Yeah. So that post to me was the most fun to do ever because writing is hard and, uh, and, 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 but just, you know, finding facts about timelines and making this little simple graphic uh, and getting excited about, oh, when this is done, this is going to be such a great graphic. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so excited to own this just to be able to like reference it. And I was, and, and, and I'm like, or, and, and, and I was learning a lot. So to me, I had a great time making that. And that's, I, there's very few posts I go back to myself to, because if I start rereading for a second, I, I, all I do is all I can think is all the things I want to change. Um, and so I, I don't usually do that, but with, with that post, I go there all the time just to actually get information or just to look at it. Cause I think it's so interesting. Um, just cause history is so interesting and the spans of time are so incredible. Uh, and, and, and that to me, that, that graphic really kind of, uh, just makes, you know, clarifies that in my head. So I, that to me is like my favorite or, you know, I don't know, cer certain, uh, you know, which is a funny answer because that's again one of the few that doesn't have my own voice in it. But yeah, <laughs> and no, it's it's good. It's an honest answer. I love the the novelty aspect that you kind of continue and you you know you're sticking with the things that 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 interest you. And you know what you said earlier about retaining this sense of sort of humanity and the people who are writing to be liked versus actually just being their authentic, you know, their themselves. And, and I think there's, I think in today's society, when, you know, everything is measured by a page view or a click or something, it, it's, it's so important that, you know, you, you do have this sense of overwhelming honesty. And, and the moment that you don't, the moment that you are kind of, playing around and the moment that a person senses that you're that you've just created this post so that they can click on it the sooner that they're gone and and i mean you just don't ever see them again or well, I, I don't think that used to be the case i think that this we are now living i i i think this is becoming more and more obvious in an era of 
uh, people, like authenticity being the most important thing. Uh, people don't want fancy graphics, you know, high budget, you know, corporate graphics, uh, you know, on something they don't want journalist voices. Um, they, they, they don't want, you know, cheesy ads and marketing messages that are obvious. They just people, and, and they're starting to really, really hate clickbait. And, and, and it's one of these things where, um, uh, you know, you can just see it. Like Louis C.K. is such a product that, you know, he, of course, you know, he, this is like the Louis C.K. era and almost, you know, this guy is so honest, so authentic. He, you know, and, and, and of course he's the most popular stand-up comedian in the world. And I just think there's that, you know, John Stewart was so, you know, himself. That's why he was so ragingly popular that, that this, you know, the young, current young generation, like they'd rather you be mediocre and, and, and unprepared, but raw and yourself than being, you know, something that is, that, that, that you're bullshitting them for whatever reason. And what happens is when you, when you're in that era, people develop a, a really, really fine tuned bullshit radar that I don't think they had 30 years ago. It just wasn't as, I don't think, you know, I don't think that it, authenticity was that big a deal then. You know, I think it, you know, professionality or other things mattered, but um, so I, I think that that's just something that, you know, it doesn't matter how, um, it, it doesn't matter how good you are at being authentic. It's, it's hard and it's hard to continue to be that way because it's kind of scary to just be yourself, but that's what people want. They want real people. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, what you said earlier about how, as you develop this sort of following and as it increases the, that pressure of that, the idea of, you know, okay, there's going to be, you know, 10,000, a hundred thousand people reading this. Holy shit. That blows my mind. I mean, um, so it, it does kind of change. It's kind of like the Schrodinger's kind of cat, you know, is it alive or is it dead? And once you right. look at it, you know, you, you're, you find out, but you've changed the outcome, right? Is there, any certain thing that you feel like you've learned about people through through the success of the blog? Well, it's a little along the lines of what I just said. I think that um, I think that at least at least my readers. I mean, they they want substance and they want authenticity, and uh, I think people want to learn. Like, I think a lot of people have a craving to learn. I mean, it's this crazy structure of our society where you're supposed to learn until 22 or, you know, or whatever around 22. And then, and then that, then you've learned stuff and now you go and you do stuff. And that's just so outrageous given that, you know, you can, the, the best, the most genius scientists of all time, people like Feynman and Einstein and Newton, they are, they have quote after quote after quote about how they know, nothing and how they, they there's there's an ocean of stuff they'll never know so there's just it, it, and learning is is so um invigorating and it's so um uh and just i i think it can it can it, it once you know le learning suddenly makes um m makes it, it makes that it makes more learning about that topic suddenly super fun and it makes it really fun to talk about it suddenly and it feels really great and it's also just really interesting if it's taught in an interesting way. I think also a lot of us brand learning as boring because learning in school is boring. Um, so I think that uh, people want to learn a lot more than uh, I think sometimes they get credit for. And I think um, people want authenticity. I think, again, so many people are um, kind of scared to just kind of be themselves, scared to curse, scared to, uh, to kind of... Um, to kind of just be kind of casual, uh, you know, that, that we're not, we're, no one's wearing suits to work anymore. Like it's just a different time. It's just, oh, it's busy. It's okay to be a human publicly now. It's like a full <laughs> normal human is fine. It's like fine, you know, and people are going to like you for that. And the paradigm has shifted. And, you know, I, th I think people expect different things now. We're so inundated with information and if if you watch television i mean spare your soul but i mean if if you subject yourself for that to that media is constantly pushing all this information at us all the time so i think i think just to remain relatively sane i think we have to kind of limit and so be very selective of what we decide to feed our our brains our minds yeah i think there's just i, I i'm already just overwhelmed i open you know my podcast app and i see 
how many multiples of hours uh, of, of, of great content out there that I'll never have time for, how many audiobooks I have in my thing. Just looking at that, my options in the morning, um, there's, there's no way. And so, um, and there's so much great, like amazing, amazing stuff to take in that, uh, that it's insane how much time I waste on, on taking in bad stuff. I, it's crazy, but I think we all do still just out of habit or out of, you know, I don't know. Like, you know, it's like, you know, it's almost like to take in something really good. I have to commit. That's the activity. I'm going to read this great book right now. And, and I end up taking in more content, not when I've decided to take in content, but when I've decided to work and I'm procrastinating and I'm just for a minute, I'm going to read this stupid thing. And then that turns into 40 minutes. And now that thing, that kind of crappy con content consumption took up 40 minutes while I spent zero minutes that day reading something really great that's sitting in my bag that I'm dying to read. So, you know, I, I think that, um, that, yeah, I just think we should have a meter on for <laughs> reminding ourselves how much great stuff there is every time we're reading something or consuming something or watching some stupid video that is not really enriching us or delighting us. Yeah. So Tim, I mean, we're, we're running out of time here. I've got, you know, I really want to drive this, this home and I, and I, I really want the listeners, the people who are listening to kind of get to know you better as a person. So, you know, is, is there any single one thing that you would, I mean, how old are you now? 34. So is there any single one thing that you would go back and tell your 21 year old self? Oh, so many things. But, uh, I think the main thing is just the thing that jumps out at me. Um, is, you know, as far as career goes, at least, uh, I would tell myself that the world is mostly built, um, you know, in it, the world is built um, by people who didn't really know what they were doing and that, and that, and that everything I've gotten, you know, the, it's seen the inside of a company, or uh, uh, the, the way someone has made an, an album or something else that you think is this amazing process you could never touch is actually just kind of like flawed people. And if you think you're really good at something, uh, you're probably better at it than the people who are doing it and that are famous for it. You probably are. There's a good chance. Just because they're, you know, they're, they're doing it and they're famous for it does not mean they're in this. It's not, it's not like sports. You know, it's not like, I think I'm pretty good at basketball, but I could never be Michael Jordan. Right. You could never be Michael Jordan. But that people apply that logic to a, a lot of other things, art and business. They look at, you know, someone who sold their company for a billion dollars. They look at someone who is a number one best-selling author and they, they, they say, well, that's the same fame level. That's the same. They're the top 0.01%, just like Michael Jordan. So I couldn't be them. And that's not true. It's not like basketball at all. There's a good chance a person selling their company for a billion dollars is not any better at business than you. And I really, if, if you think you're, if you think you're good, you think not great, but you think you're a smart person who has a knack for this thing. That is a, that means a lot. If you think you're a smart person who has a knack for something, you, you probably can be the 0.01%. Uh, and really what the, the, the main thing that's in your way is not the superhuman talent. Cause it's not even, that doesn't exist. What, what the main thing that's in your way is that you're not going to go for it. You're not going to charge ahead for 10 years and try to do it because you think it's a, it's a hopeless quest, like trying to become uh, Michael Jordan. So, and, but I got daunted by that for, I didn't start something like wait, but why with all my might, I did all these creative projects on the side yeah. for 10 years because yeah. I, I didn't have the guts to just do it full time. Cause it felt like a, you know, what are the chances? That's a one in a thousand. It's just completely false. And if I could go back, I would have dove full head, you know, head first into creative endeavors. I thought I was good at, um, full time with my full time job starting right after college. And I took me nine years instead. I feel like you should drop the mic after that little statement. <laughs> Beautiful, man. Love that. So crucial. And, and I agree 100%. I feel like we're so misled. And I mean, our, our, the structure in which we kind of create learning and distribute knowledge is so flawed. And the direction in which people are going to chase what they think are their dreams and then realize aren't. Um, and then end up, you know, quitting their corporate jobs to go and refine themselves again, end up on pages like yours or listening to podcasts like mine. What's next for you, Tim? What is, I mean, what is, uh, 
what's your what's your what's your next goal? What's your next thing? What are you gonna be doing next? Yeah, so right now I just my main challenge in life is to try to be as productive with writing uh, as I was uh, in the first two years, you know, uh, right now, because um, there's, you know, I, it, it's, uh, I, I, I'm just trying to right now do Wait But Why well uh, for a while and just, you know, continue to do this thing, but really, really be writing a lot. Uh, so that's my first, my first goal is just in the near future, just write a bunch of really good blog posts. Uh, very excited about that right now. And I feel like I haven't gotten enough out recently. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, uh, I think I'm, you know, looking at bigger kind of a bigger project, either, a, either a book or a, like a video series or something that to kind of continue to push myself out of my comfort zone and challenge myself with something like totally new, um, but still with the same, but still under, you know, still with weight, but why, and still with the same kind of trying to get the same kind of messages out, but just trying to do it in a medium that I'm not comfortable with. Cause I think that's, this is still a good time to be doing that. So I would say that's, those are the main things on my mind. Cool. Uh, Tim, where can, where can people find, um, your blog, your work? Um, everything is just at weightbutwide.com. That's basically every everything that exists for me currently that matters <laughs> is there. So, uh, and then you know I always tell people that uh, the best way to the best way to kind of uh, stay in touch to like you know if you if you like it is just to do the email subscription because the, that's I just know from myself I end up really keeping up with things that uh, they're going to email me every time there's a new post. And the ones when they don't, even if I like it, I just forget about it for a long period of time. So, Tim, thank you so much for your time, man. I, I love what you're doing. Love the message. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This is The Human Experience. We will see you guys next week. Thank you guys so much for listening.